too can help save a life. Vote now and help recognize and reward South Africa's rescue services. The next life they save could be yours. I got a phone call from Rescue South Africa to come assist. Um, we had to bring one or two items of equipment that we needed. I phoned Bernard and I said to him, Ballas, you got to get here. It's, it's literally like I've arrived at another earthquake zone, like I'd arrived in Haiti. It was, it was literally like a movie. We're here today to celebrate the fact that we worked on a rescue together uh, in uh, Orlando in Soweto some months ago, where we were involved in part of the rescue and we called in UJ and some of the paramedics that form part of our group of, uh, of rescuers when we go and do a rescue. And the value that they bring to the party, of course, is the fact that they've they're specialists in uh, urban search and rescue, but they're also paramedics who were able to assist us in uh, treating the patient during the, the course of the, of the rescue. Once we arrived at the incident, um, we, were, we reported to the, to the incident commander. We were uh, directed to the, to the sector where this gentleman was entrapped. Uh, I was the sector commander at uh, the collapse in Power Park Soweto, where uh, one of the victims uh, ended up with an amputation because of the complication of the rescue. When I got there, I, I checked in with the rescue team leader, found out exactly what was happening. And that, that initial team had bore a tunnel um, underneath the main floor structure and, and, and had been able to locate and access the patient. The problem was that the, the, when the surgeon got there for the first time, he said there's no ways that he can operate in these, in these conditions. Obviously we had to then rethink and change the strategy and work from the top. Yeah. At that stage, Bernard and I had to be split up because Bernard needed to access directly underneath the patient. We took over the patient care itself and then I worked with some of the teams on top to continue that um, breaking of the, of the structure above him. As much as you have to access from the top, you still need someone to be with the patient, to monitor the patient and to make sure that the patient is safe. I essentially maintained uh, contact with the patient and I maintained patient care until we um, had a big enough space open for the surgeons to come in. Uh, there was a difference in qualification between the, the guys that managed the patient earlier and me um, and that was essentially the reason why I took over. I could give some more medications and I could make sure that the patient is a bit more pain free than what he was prior to me getting there. This is one of the eye beams. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the yeah, second I beam is on, so this is on the second floor. Oh, uh, who, who, who's in this picture? This is me, yeah. this is Connor, yeah. and that's the surgeon. No, that's the patient. That's the patient. That's the patient. That's where's, the, patient. The, where's the surgeon? The uh, surgeon yet. isn't there yet. We're still um, clearing the area. We're still, we're still clearing the area. Okay. And the, the, the poor chap who was saved in the end was lying down there on his tummy, man, with something on his arm, huge steel beam. There was someone with him all the time, lying flat next to him because there wasn't enough space to, to do anything else. You'll see that I don't have a, um, a fire jacket on like that because the space to get in there was too small. I actually had to take the jacket off. And we decided to go from the top down and create space above the patient. This unfortunately involved us cutting through about 12 to 20 mil thick steel, a um, lot of rebar in the concrete, a lot of concrete breaking, just to get down to that, that corrugated iron dome. Um, you know, using, using the concrete breaking equipment and, the, and, the, and the, the concrete breakers, the circular saws. What makes this different to a normal circumstance where you've got in love with space, um, this is a structural collapse incident that, co that, that resulted in a confined space place area that was filled with debris. We need to, to make sure that it's safe a, for the surgical team to go in, so they don't have rescue training. The second thing is we need to still make sure that the patient is okay by the time the surgeons or the surgical key team got there. Uh, but once we had cut through the steel uh, reinforcements, we were able to get down to that corrugated iron dome that he was under. The, the patient was conscious up until the point of the amputation. The patient was asked permission uh, and was explained why the amputation was necessary. The patient was awake enough to give permission before the amputation occurred. And since it was in such an enclosed place, the amputation was quite difficult. The surgeon literally had to sit on his haunches and worked into a, into a little hole uh, or into a little area, even though we opened as much as we could. And so I directly handed over to the anaesthetist and then after that I took over patient care again in order to transfer the patient to the hospital. Our rescue services, as you all know, are quite fragmented and yet in a moment like this, they just 
come together because there's a focus, there's one thing that needs to be done, and that is we have to save these lives. So, in this instance, the city of Johannesburg, Ekuruleli EMS, West Rand EMS, Rescue South Africa, SAPS K9 Search and Rescue, Riga Rescue, Off-Road Rescue Unit, ER24, the University of Johannesburg Medics, all worked as one unit. Fire Chiefs, you can truly be proud of these people. Thank you again.